right, so we are live right now with Nicole Cardinelli. So you are what uh, influencer, blogger, and you were an actress or still an actress as well, right? I'm not an actress anymore. Um, I did acting when I was younger, probably from the ages of 10, and then I stopped around 17, 18. So I'm 22 now, so I stopped a while ago. Okay, and I think this is a good way to start because I always talk about in order to build a personal brand, which you have, you know, you have a bunch of like 100,000 followers or over 100,000 followers on TikTok and over 200,000 on Instagram. And I feel like the best way to leverage your personal brand is if you have, say, a talent or a unique feature about yourself, you know, you can always leverage that to get more exposure. And was that mm -hmm. something that you kind of did early in your career as, when you were an actress to grow your personal um, brand? No, I never thought about it back then because social media influencers were not a thing when I was like 10, 11. It was, YouTube was brand new and nobody knew that you could monetize any of it. But I think that my experience helped it a lot. Um, I'm not one of those like acting TikTokers where I'll like voice over something or do like the acting TikTok. I, I don't do that. But I think that my experience in the industry has helped me more with making connections and knowing how to talk to brands, stuff like that. I think that aspect has helped me more than anything. Okay. So when you first got into social media, you never thought about, you know, working with brands because I've seen like some of your pages or some of your um, content on, on Instagram and you've done some, some brand, some branded content, some sponsored mm -hmm. content. Now, how did that come along? How long did it take you to grow a personal brand and then have brands hit you up? It took a while and it was a really um, weird journey. So when I first started my Instagram, I was in middle school and I, you know, I didn't think anything of it. And then once I quit acting, I amassed probably about 20 to 30,000 followers, which back then was a decent amount. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to quit acting, I was like, oh, well, I mean, I have this platform. Like, why don't I do something with it? And why don't I, I, cause influencers were just starting. It was like the very beginning. And I was like, maybe I can, you know, monetize it. Maybe I can do something through that because uh, I grew up in a very business and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship focused household. Um, mm -hmm. My dad owns his own company. He has his whole life just owned his own companies. And he really instilled that into me and my brother when we were young, where he was like, you need several sources of income. You need, you know, you need constant different outlets. You can't just put all your eggs in one basket. You need just a bunch of different things. So growing up, I mean, I, I got my first job at 16. I've worked ever since, but I always had several streams of income, whether that be acting. Um, I resell sneakers <laughs> um, with my brother. Um, and then uh, I started doing the influencer marketing and that all kind of just brings okay. in all different types of income. But I saw that there was an opportunity there and I started with reaching out to brands because I was so small. Um, and I kind of just had many goals where in the beginning I was like, okay, I just want anything for free. Even if it's a toothbrush, I don't care <laughs> for free. And then I moved on to, you know, maybe a hundred dollars worth of items and so on and so forth until I got to get paid for sponsored deals or travel and like get a, a flight paid for hotels, so on and so forth. That's really interesting because, you know, you said you came from an entrepreneurial family, you flipped sneakers, did that influencer marketing. Um, and you, you had a job since you were 16 acting, uh, that's content that you don't really post on your Instagram, right? Because not no. many people would know about your entrepreneurial tendencies. So you said Definitely your father not. always had multiple businesses. Yeah. Um, since I was born, he always owned his own businesses, sometimes more than one. Um, and he pretty much was able to retire at, in his mid thirties, but decided hmm. not to just because he absolutely loves what he does. So now he kind of just yeah doing what he's doing um and it was really inspiring to grow up with someone like that so in a way I felt pressure to do something and he always said to me and my brother he's like you guys are always on these phones he's like if you're gonna be on them 24 7 make money and my brother started reselling sneakers he has pretty much now he's 17 like an entire business of reselling sneakers where he makes more than some people with a full-time job and then I kind of took some of that from him and I was like, okay, I want it on it. Like what mm -hmm. box am I getting? <laughs> what are we doing? Um, so he did that. And then I sort of went into more of the creative aspect of influencer marketing. So we're both kind of doing mm -hmm. something. 
Um, That's kind of cool though. So your dad, you know, pushed you guys to do business. Now, what about like your other family members, maybe your mom, did they encourage mm-hmm. school? Was there kind of one person saying go to school and the other person like, Hey, you should make money online. Go, go into <laughs> entrepreneurship. My mom is definitely more cookie cutter in a sense where she was like, school's your number one priority. I don't care what you do online. She was like, if you don't get good grades, then you're not doing this. Even with acting when I was younger, she was like, if you don't keep your grades up, you're not going on auditions. It's just that simple. We're not stopping any of your life for this because in the end that might not take off and then you have nothing. So school is always a main priority. And even for me, I never put school behind acting. I mean, obviously there were times if I was shooting, I had to take off but I always had tutors on set. I always, always did my schoolwork. Um, I finished college with my bachelor's degree um, just this past May. So I always wanted to have other things just in case my original plans didn't work out. And even now I just um, accepted an offer for a full, full-time position as a digital marketing manager for a company. So nice. um, influencer, being like an influencer <laughs> isn't my full-time job yet. Um, I'm not even sure if I want it to be or if I always want it to keep it um, as something I do on the side. I feel like I have the mindset where if it's meant to be, it'll be. And if it takes off, it does. If not, I mean, I have other outlets that I could use um, and I'll be okay. Yeah, I think as long as, like, even though you're not, say you're not monetizing it to the full potential, you still have an asset of, you know, different yeah. platforms such as TikTok and Instagram that you can leverage to other sell Maybe you want to come up with your own product, your own line of something, or, Mm -hmm. you know, pretty much, you know, any brand can hit you up at some point and you can have a deal there. But I think what you have right now is definitely an asset. And, you know, a lot of people would kill to have, you know, of course, TikTok is growing right now. And people sometimes have that problem of, you know, moving their audience from TikTok to Instagram, Mm -hmm. maybe even vice versa, or to other platforms such as YouTube and Twitter. But I think once you kind of dominate one and move on to the other, just kind of like a domino effect where it becomes easier, I think. So that's yeah. always helpful. It's definitely hard to switch them over through different platforms because I feel like people on TikTok are so different from people on Instagram. Um, and the whole demographic is just totally, totally different where I think TikTok is so much more real and so much more unfiltered where Instagram is pretty much as fake as you can get, um, if I'm being blunt. Um, you know, it's a highlight reel of everybody's life. Whereas TikTok, I'm a lot more fun. I, I don't really care what I post. I kind of post whatever. And sometimes the silliest things do really well on TikTok. Whereas Instagram, it has to be like critiqued perfectly. And, mm-hmm. you know, everything has to be right. Yeah, I was talking to uh, a content creator, Ryan McGinn. And, you know, he told me that with TikTok, you have to show your face. There's no other way around it. And he said, it's one of the best platforms to get into social media if you're that's your first platform because you know if you're camera shy right like i was in the beginning just showing your face for 10 15 30 seconds at most isn't all that bad compared to a youtube video because it's long form content right whereas tiktok is one and done and that's pretty much it right um and the funny thing is like when i started my tiktok i was so comfortable because the for you page was it wasn't localized i think so nobody knew or in my area in Stanford, Connecticut, no one really found my content, right? Um, but after a while, it did become localized. So when you're on the camera and people all the way across the world are watching your, your videos and whatnot, it feels like no one's watching your videos. But once it becomes more yeah. localized, people start to recognize and then you can get that feeling like, oh, everyone's watching me. But I think, like you said, TikTok, you have to be real for those first 10 to 15 seconds. It's really hard to, um, I guess, to pull off an Instagram, if that makes sense. Yeah. I definitely felt that more, I think, when I was in middle school and high school. Not so much in college because there's so many people and no one really cares what you're doing. Um, But in high school, I went to an all-girls private high school. And, you know, it feels like all eyes are on you sometimes and people can be very judgmental. So I definitely felt awkward because I was just starting to get into Instagram marketing and working with brands. And, you know, people would talk and it makes you feel uncomfortable. And I know a lot of, especially YouTubers have gone through that where they've been in high school and their YouTube career might've been taking off and people could be mean, but I definitely think after that, um, I started to care less and less because it didn't feel like so localized. It didn't Mm -hmm. feel like everybody was watching. Um, Even though 
I mean, the same people are probably still watching. It's just a, like a mindset thing. Yeah. Speaking about mindset, did you get comfortable because you got none to the fact of you posting so much content and you didn't care? Or was it that you did acting and you're so used to having a camera in your face when you were young, starting at 16? Like, was mm -hmm. that the fact that you were just so used to acting and having cameras in front of you that social media was kind of, you know, just another thing? Um, I think it's a mixture of both. So I never cared about being on camera. I never cared about anything like that. Um, just because I did start acting really young, like 10, 11 years old. And it never bothered me. Um, I was never camera shy. I'm definitely more shy in person. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to just like socially, I'm extremely shy. I'm definitely an introvert, which is weird because I feel like most people that are in that industry are not, and they're definitely extroverts, but I definitely am not extroverted. Um, but also at some point, probably when I got into college, I stopped caring so much about what people thought when I was posting something online. Um, I was like, screw it. Like, wh why do I care that much about random people that like live around me or that I went to high school with? Um, that's why I started TikTok. That's why I did, you know, I just, I wanted to post what I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And if people liked it and they liked my personality, great. If not, screw off. Yeah. But did you have any, was there any time where you were kind of reluctant to post certain things because you felt maybe insecure? I think everyone goes through that at some point. Yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, especially being on like on social media, this day and age on Instagram as a girl where everybody has the perfect body and, you know, big lips and a tiny, tiny waist. And it's like, okay, well, I don't look like <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> But I think you have to realize that nobody looks like that and it's extremely unrealistic and the sooner we figure that out the better But I'm not gonna lie. I still get insecure and I still feel like shit sometimes and um, I don't know. I think it's just something that I'm still working on that still takes time But I'm getting more and more comfortable with posting what I want um, I think TikTok has helped that a lot because I see so many different personalities and it just feels like such a welcoming environment, even though I know a lot of people have their mm -hmm. tips about that. Um, I feel like it's very welcoming. Um, I think that's why my original like viral video on TikTok did so well, just like a, a dumb story time about a Disney celebrity. Um, I don't know if you saw that one, but that was like my first viral video. Was it the one that had uh, 1.6 million views and counting? Is that... I think it has 10, 10, million, more. Now. 10 million. Okay. Maybe I'm looking at a different one yeah. then, but yeah, I think everyone, no matter how attractive, how talented you are, everyone has something in them where they feel slightly insecure, you know, yeah. and I think it's just a human aspect. It's a, a human element just to feel insecure. But I think to get out of that shell, you have to talk about things that you genuinely love and are passionate about. So for yeah. example, you always talk about or post content on traveling and lifestyle and even though you're an introvert, I'm pretty sure that if someone talks about you, about these certain topics, you become an extrovert because you're, you, yeah. know, you know a lot about it, right? Definitely. Um, yeah, definitely when I'm, I'm talking about topics that I love, you know, such, I post a lot about traveling, obviously not now because of COVID. So I've switched over to cooking, which is another passion of mine. I almost went to culinary school when I was younger. Um, I really, really love it. And again, TikTok was the perfect platform because I never posted about that on my Instagram and I never showed that side. So it's nice to have different platforms where you can post like different parts of your personality and those people will come if they like it. Yeah. Now, speaking about transitioning from traveling to cooking, you know, say you have an Instagram page and you post specific content of just traveling and then out of nowhere, you post content of you cooking. Do you think yeah. that it's better to not care at all to what people think about your content being switched from traveling to cooking or is it better to like you said go on tiktok a different platform and really show another side of who you are personally i think that transitioning just on instagram would be a silly business decision um just because okay. i already have a demographic on there and mm -hmm. i already have brands that i know that like the certain things that i post so if i completely switch that I have a chance of losing everything that I built up. Okay. So, so I wouldn't do that. Subjective to each person yeah. then. Depends. Yeah. Okay. So definitely, I mean, it, you know, if your page is all about different things, then go ahead and post whatever you want. But for me, I think that it was a smarter idea to 
position in a different mm -hmm. light instead of like showcasing it all over my Instagram out of nowhere and then possibly losing brand deals or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you got into Instagram early, right? And that's how you got, mm -hmm. I mean, if you start with anything early, you know, you kind of get a massive following almost right yeah. away if you post content consistently. Um, so now like you had 30,000 followers from the get-go on, on Instagram and you've grown that to over 200K. But, mm -hmm. you know, you have to start from scratch on TikTok. And, you yeah. know, a lot of people might think, you know, I have all these followers on, say, Twitter, YouTube, and say they have one dominant platform and they're not willing to go to another platform because they don't want to start from scratch and they're really tired and they just fo they'd rather focus on one platform, put all their eggs on one basket. Now, yeah. when you started from scratch on TikTok, did you kind of had that feeling or were you like, I just want to expand my own personal brand or express myself in a different way because on Instagram... I wasn't able to show uh, like culinary stuff and cooking. Um, I didn't look at TikTok as a new business venture. Um, in the beginning, mm -hmm. it was more just for fun. And I thought that it was an opportunity just to kind of express myself in a different way and just have fun with it. Um, it kind of took off by itself. I honestly didn't really do any monetizing with TikTok. I didn't even promote it on my Instagram at all. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of ran with it and it took off on its own and very quickly, which was so, so different from Instagram because Instagram is very like slow, steady, like you'll get there unless you're, you know, like Addison Rae, then it <laughs> catapults you immediately. But with TikTok, it could be one day you have zero followers and the next day you have a hundred thousand Yeah. over, over one video or over a few videos that do well. And it's just a totally, totally different algorithm that I still don't understand. I've tried doing research on it and I still don't really get it. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to master it, but I don't think there's any way to master TikTok's algorithm because whatever they want to blow up will blow <laughs> up. Um, but yeah, no, I did it. I, did, I started TikTok just for fun. It kind of did its own thing. And then now I'm part of the TikTok, um, marketplace like the creators mm -hmm. okay i tried their creator fund and i left um after a few weeks because i noticed that my views were going down like exponentially just like the day i joined the creator fund i went from getting like fifty thousand views like every video to a few hundred or like two thousand and it wasn't a coincidence no it's not a coincidence because the, the day I left the creator fund and posted a video, it did well. Huh. That's weird. I don't think, I mean, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not. It seems like it is. And it seems like a lot of other people have had similar issues where you are almost shadow banned. Mm -hmm. So um, I left the creator fund and honestly, like they it, it did not pay well. It was like point like three cents for every like 1000 views, it was, you pretty much have to be like Charlie to make good money on it. Yeah. I think yeah. they're trying to replicate what YouTube is doing right now. I mean, yeah. you can, if you have that same amount of followers on YouTube, I think you can, you know, make you a lot more way, money. Way better on YouTube. Yeah. But yeah. still, I think it's still a good opportunity. They're kind of starting out with that. And I think they added oh, yeah. a new shopping feature as well. Cause I always spoke about it'll be really cool if TikTok had a shopping feature where you can tag your photos like you have on Instagram because Instagram is very businessy now. And right. if they can make TikTok like that, which I think eventually will, um, that would just be really good for any entrepreneur trying to sell their products or affiliate links and whatnot. Definitely. I think companies are having a little bit of a hard time right now trying to get their footing on TikTok because mm -hmm. it's not a business platform. It's not someplace oh, no. where you can sell a product, but you know, little by little, they're getting there. They're figuring yeah. out how to monetize the platform. Um, yeah, it'll get there. I don't know about the purchasing aspect of it yet. Is that I've seen, or? I've, I've seen a video where, you know, this girl who's selling uh, lip glosses, you can add a mm -hmm. link, but it's not so direct compared to Instagram. There's kind of, I guess there's a lot of resistance in terms of trying to find that product, if that makes sense. But it's, yeah. basically what I'm trying to say here is that the flow, the workflow of trying to buy a product through TikTok isn't as efficient as, as Instagrams. Yeah, definitely yeah. not. Wait now. So if you're an influencer or say you have a large following, should you like say someone, wa someone listening wants to be an influencer and they have a decent following, say 10,000, 50,000 followers. 
Now, should they wait and expect for someone to hit them up to get, you know, to be on a sponsored post or should they go out and look for business? Oh, go out a hundred, a hundred and ten percent. Do not sit around and wait for a sponsorship to come because you'll be waiting a while. Um, no, that's how I started. That's how most of these creators start. Even though I feel like a lot don't talk about it, but in the beginning, pretty much all of us are pitching ourselves to brands and emailing. We have email lists by the hundreds of just companies and PR people and everybody just asking for stuff practically. Mm-hmm and um, asking to go to events. And that's how I started going to Fashion Week a few years ago was just by asking. Um, And then slowly you start getting invited to things when you get bigger. But in the beginning, it it doesn't happen that easy where they just all reach out to you. You know, they don't know who you are. There's so many influencers out there. You have to kind of introduce yourself to them. Mm -hmm. So how do you find these brands? I mean, it can be very um, outlandish to maybe hit up Sephora and then ask for products (laughs) to be part of their of like to have your products and whatnot. But if you want to work with smaller brands, uh, mm-hmm. where do you kind of find them? Or what are the right brands for someone who has maybe less than a hundred thousand followers? Um, it depends on what your niche is and mm-hmm. what your Instagram or TikTok is about. But if you're, let's say a fashion blogger, you can reach out to smaller boutiques or, you know, maybe a boutique in your neighborhood or your city that you grew up in. And Definitely make a media kit. That's something that I had to figure out in the very beginning was just make a really awesome media kit. I use Canva just because I think it's so easy, but um, it pretty much just is a nice little summary of yourself. It has some pictures, your demographics. You should have all your insights in there. But I personally would go to their websites. I would go to like their contact us. And then you'd be surprised. A lot of companies have like their marketing department they'll have like an Mm -hmm. email there and it's just like it's kind of like a cold call it's like hi this is who i am this is what i do this is what i could offer to your company um and this is what i'm asking for in exchange you know i definitely in from the get-go didn't ask for money because i was reaching out to them so i just you know you just want to start creating a relationship and then if it goes well you can start you know talking about compensation and monetization other things like that Mm -hmm. But definitely from the get-go, I I didn't ask for money. Okay. You say you just wanted free products, right? Yeah. That's in the very (laughs) beginning. That's, that was all that enticed me. I was like, people are getting free stuff. I'm like, I want free stuff. I was like, I want free clothes. (laughs) That'd be so dope. Yeah. I had this one friend and she, she's into like food related uh, stuff. She has her own page. And I think every week, not that I asked how she got into it, but I think every week or so, like a new brand would send her stuff and then she would obviously promote it on, on Instagram. And it's like these little snacks that like these cute little snacks and it looks so good. And it's really cool just to have like free stuff, but I actually never thought about, you know, having to look for business. If you are an influencer, I always thought if you have X amount of followers, people are bound to find you and you know, you can start monetizing like that. They do some do, but it's not, as much as you'd want if you're trying to really make money with it you're mm-hmm. not going to get as you'd be surprised even people like i have over i guess 300,000 followers between the two platforms and i still mm-hmm. get pe- plenty of um dms or emails of people wanting you know free promotions or in exchange for like a discount and i'm like now i'm at the point where i can say no to things okay and in the beginning i definitely said yes to a lot more things than maybe i wanted to just because it was a good experience but now i'm kind of at the point where i could say thank you for the offer these are my rates if you want to do that but i I, you know i can't do free promotion anymore Mm -hmm. what are some key aspects for any aspiring influencer or blogger uh to do for example like how many times, like, should you be religious about posting as much as possible every single day? Um, I would say post as much as your followers seem to like you post. Like, don't bombard them with, like, 10 posts a day because I personally don't like that. I'll unfollow someone if they're <laughs> posting 20 times a day. Um, and I should definitely practice what I preach because I don't post as much as I should. Um but it definitely depends on the platform. If it's like Instagram, I'd say once a day is fine. And then maybe a few stories um, for TikTok, maybe two or three times a day or four times a day, um, because that's scattered out on your free page. It's not so like back to back. 
but yeah, I definitely uh, think that less is more sometimes and to be more authentic, especially nowadays on social media where everything is so filtered. It's, I really enjoy only following people now who are, you know, that feel very authentic, that show their true selves, that show their personality more and aren't so, you know, cookie cutter and show hard parts of their life and discuss different topics that aren't always, you know, the happiest things because that's real life. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, I think, what people want to see. So I would say just to be as authentic as possible and, you know, the right community will find you. Yeah, I think that's definitely the hard part, just being completely authentic because like you mentioned before, you know, Instagram uh, is a highlight reel and not too many people show their, down, their downfalls or insecurities and that's really hard to be honest because once it's up there, it it's up there, yeah. you know, but people say, but I think that people really respect it. Oh yeah. And I think someone said that if you, if you make fun of yourself first, or if you expose yourself first, then there's nothing that anyone can do to really hurt you because you kind of, yeah. you're the first person to really show your insecurities. You were voluntarily showing yourself off in a bad way, like to show that content. And so yeah no one can really bad, bad mouth you because you kind of put yourself in that position. Um, and I think that's kind of one way to look at it. But yeah. now that you mentioned that, okay, say you have X amount of followers, you're looking for business, looking for uh, sponsored posts and brand deals. Now here comes the question. How often should you work with these brands? Because if you see someone who literally every post is a sponsored post, they can lose some of their brand equity and people yeah. might be like, you know, they're just doing this for the money at the end of the day. They're not posting something that's fun anymore. They're not posting mm -hmm. something that's really about them. So maybe I shouldn't follow them. Like what's the balance between sponsored posts and authentic posts? Is there like a ratio? Um, I like 70-30 with 70 being your actual post, like what you really enjoy posting and then 30% mm -hmm. sponsored deals. Um, I don't like when someone's page is overtaken with ads. It just... It, it does feel like they're really just doing this for money and they don't actually enjoy it because mm -hmm. if you're doing it, you should be passionate about it. And it's an amazing job to have and um, you should love it and enjoy doing it other than just posting for sponsor deal for sponsorships. Um, mm -hmm. So I think 70, 30. Okay. I think that's a good ratio. Yeah. If you were to work with say two or three brands, like your dream brands, if they were to hit you up, what brands would you like them to be? Probably like Marriott Hotels. I would mm. love to do something <laughs> with them. I think that would be cool. I've worked with Hilton uh, once and that was really cool. But I'd love to work with like Marriott and create and kind of be like a brand ambassador where I can mm -hmm. travel more with them. Um, and maybe a cool cooking company. Maybe like Cuisinart or KitchenAid. And I feel like corny as that sounds I'd really like a cool sponsorship with them because I really want a stand mixer and I don't want to spend like four hundred dollars on one. Oh, I was gonna say is KitchenAid the company that sends you a box every week kind of a subscription model sort of business where they send you no. stuff every week or no that's okay. um I think that's HelloFresh. Okay there's so many of them. KitchenAid is like nowadays. KitchenAid is like full-on like appliances. Oh okay. Yeah. So I feel like that'd be a cool company to work with. Yeah. Um but no, that's a HelloFresh. I think they do like the weekly yeah. food subscription thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say so many people in the traveling niche uh, who are influencers, they travel for free, which is really cool. You know, mm -hmm. just imagine it like being paid to travel, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that'd be like the ultimate, the ultimate dream for any influencer really. But, oh, it's, it's insane. I remember mm -hmm. my first one, I, I was freaked out. <laughs> I was Where do you like, go? Um, I went to Aruba. Oh my God. Yeah. How that happened? I, uh, like, what's the story behind that? Um, Aruba Tourism reached out to me, which is just, I guess the tourism company of pretty much the entire island. Um, and they were like, hey, we'd really love for you to come. Like, we'll pay for your flights. And um, yeah. And I was like, okay. And what about like housing? They were like, we're not going to offer housing, but you can maybe reach out to a few hotels on the island. So that's mm -hmm. where I came in. And they actually, they put me in contact with a few hotels. And I was talking to them and I was like, Hey, I'm working with so-and-so I'd like to work with you. Also, we can kind of just do one big collab and that's how that happened. So, um, they then comped my hotel and my food. 
So oh. I brought my mom. So it was a few years ago and we went, yeah, fully comped and she was, she's a huge, huge travel bug. Um, she <laughs> loves it. So she was like, okay, when's the next one? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I was going to ask, like, were you allowed to bring a guest? Because if was, you weren't yeah. allowed, it would be kind of sketchy, you know, going so, to a different country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely wouldn't have wanted to travel by myself. So I always, I always ask for a plus one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, wait, you wouldn't like backpack around the, the country or different parts of the world? A lot of people do that. I think that's pretty cool. As much as I'd love to, um, I don't think I would just because traveling, I don't, I don't by myself. As a girl, I'm a very like petite person. I feel like I look very young for my age. I just wouldn't feel safe, honestly. As much as I'd love to like backpack around Europe, I, yeah. I really don't feel safe doing that. Yeah, that is. It's nice to experience places with other people, um, you know, make memories with them. It's nice. No, I definitely agree. I think, I mean, everyone has their own perspective, mm -hmm. but at least in my opinion, not that I've traveled a whole lot, but, you know, just experience something with someone is the key to having a full fledged experience, you know, but yeah. people sometimes, you know, people are so busy nowadays that they can't have someone else travel with them. And so they're not going to wait for the rest of their life. So they're kind of forced to travel by themselves, right? Because yeah. there's no other alternative. Everyone's way too busy or maybe they can't afford it, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. they're just forced to uh, go out by themselves. Now, speaking about, you know, your businesses, you also have a, a media management company, right? Yeah. And how aggressive, like, how did that start out? It started during quarantine. Oh, out so of recent. boredom. Yeah. Um, it started in March, so pretty much the beginning of quarantine, I was already going stir crazy because I was doing my last semester of school online because they closed the campus. Um, and I, I just, I needed something to do. And I've been wanting to start a management company for a while. So this was just kind of like a push for me to start it. So it's called um, Cardinelli Media Management. And then I got the domain like social content manager, which I feel like so I kind of have two names. So one mm -hmm. is more like the, it's good for like SEO management. And mm -hmm. then the other one is more like the catchy name. But um, yeah, I just really started over quarantine because I was bored and it was something that I've been wanting to do for a while. And I think I have enough background where I could provide um, help to a lot of companies. Yeah, I think, you know, you definitely have that aspect or the experience of learning how to grow several platforms and obviously... Mm -hmm monetizing through that but um you help brands specifically help with like organic reach or, or what is it exactly it's both organic and paid social reach so i'll okay. work on um growing their brands organically through all different whatever media platforms they want to use mm -hmm. and then i'll also work with um like paid seo management or google ads or instagram ads if they have a budget i'll work with that and i'll create the campaigns for them so I'll shoot the content, create the campaigns, pretty much all of that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, marketing like entrepreneurs, people who have their own marketing agencies always tell me that in the beginning, it's extremely tough to find clients because, you know, they say, of course, you can pitch people through ads and cold calls and cold emails. Mm -hmm. But they say once you find that first several type of your first client or two, that's going to be the hardest. But then after that, it's all about word of mouth. And that's what. Yeah. you know, is a bread and butter for any marketing agencies that word of mouth and Definitely. things kind of just start to snowball. Um, the first is always the hardest because mm -hmm. you feel like you have nothing for so long. And then after one year, it's easier to get the second and third and so on and so forth. Yeah. Did you work with anyone within your family? So for example, people, so people always say, you know, work with your local network, right? Someone in your mm -hmm. family or a friend who has a business, help them out. And then you know, you get word of mouth and things start to grow? Um, no, I was able to work with a company that I used to work for. Uh, um, throughout college, I worked with a um, luxury car brand as a marketing associate for them. So then um, once I graduated, I stopped working with them and I was able to kind of freelance through this. Okay. So you're doing, you said you had a, a full-time job now. You're doing, you have your own business and you're also doing influencing Mm -hmm. uh, you're an influencer on the side. Is there anything else that you, that you do? You don't feel, you don't flip sneakers anymore? Um, not as much. Um, I'm still, I still do it sometimes on the weekends if there's like a cool drop, but 
I don't do it as much as like my brother does or my boyfriend does it also. So okay. they're, they're a lot more on top of it than I am. Right, but you keep yourself in the loop, right? Yeah, definitely. I always, I always have to know what's going on. If something really good's coming out, I will make time for it. Mm-hmm. If it's like a really good like um, resale price, then I'll do it. <laughs> well, so you guys only get hype sneakers or do you go to outlets and then you know, buy things in bulk? No, we only do um, hype drops. So we'll do like off-white. Um, Jordan 1s right now are really good. Yeezys, everything like that. And so it's only guys- pretty much hype drops. I feel that there's two ways to get these hype sneakers. Either you go to the physical location and wait there for the whole night, or I think there's something called the bots where that's you know, what we use. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, my boyfriend's a software engineer, oh, wow. so he's actually able to make some bots, which is nice. Um, and he's just really good at using them and is really good at just automation in general. So he helps us with that. And then my brother has a few bots. I have a few that we've invested in. Um, and then those are already, those are also good for reselling. You can now resell mm-hmm. like sneaker bots. Yeah. I feel like if you can automate everything and make mm-hmm. things a lot, make things a lot more efficient. Then oh yeah. No, I don't want to wait online all night for a sneaker <laughs> yeah. that I might not even get. It's a lot yeah. easier to just wake up a few hours earlier and like run the bot and see if that works. Mm-hmm. Because beforehand everyone had to, you know, go to Facebook marketplace or go to local meetups to sell a sneaker one by one. But now yeah. they have StockX and Go and these sorts of platforms. Oh, yeah. You can just sell them. It's so much easier. Yeah. In seconds. More money. Yeah. Yeah. People love those platforms. Um, yeah, we'll sell our sneakers before they even come in the mail. So it's it's so quick. But what do you mainly use? StockX, Go, or or what? Just mainly StockX? StockX or Go. Mostly StockX. Okay. Yeah. People, they're going insane on, on StockX. And I mean, I haven't sold it, any sneakers, it's but it's fun to look at it. It's fun to look at how much... Uh, a sneaker cost and of course there's mm-hmm. other items there you can like you can uh sell but primarily oh, yeah. sometimes just we'll sneakers. do like apparel if it's like a good um like supreme drop we'll do apparel also but mm-hmm. it's mostly just sneakers but it when i first started looking into it i was like no way somebody's gonna <laughs> buy like a pair of 120 dollars sneakers for 800 dollars. Mm-hmm. like who would do that and then i saw how many people did it and i was like oh, yeah. okay it's i can do that it's kind of weird because you know these questions may be outrageous. You know, who's going to buy this sneaker? But then yeah. it's hard to believe it. But once you see it, once you sell that sneaker for that price, you just start to believe in it. And everyone oh, can yeah, be skeptical kind of about it. To it. Everyone can be skeptical about it until you actually do it and you see it for yourself that it's working, mm-hmm. right? So when I was um, like uh, 18, 19, when I was like, I was a receptionist somewhere. I was at my job on a Saturday. And I was going for a Yeezy drop and everybody at work was like, cause I took up like all the computers because this is before, uh, like I had new bots. So I would do everything manually and I would open up like 50 tabs, um, before, like, before they were able to kind of like detect those things. Mm-hmm. This was sort of in the beginning. Um, also when my brother started and everyone at work would be like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to make money as I'm making money here. You got to. So. Yeah, so I was always always on the grind. Yeah, I mean, not to disrespect anyone, but sometimes when I go, say, to the gym or the library and people work in the front desk and maybe they're not doing so much, you're just there waiting and whatnot on your phones, you could definitely be really productive while working oh, on your job yeah. if you're just standing there not doing anything at all, right? Oh, no, when I was a receptionist, I was a receptionist for a few years throughout college, um, like just making extra money on the weekends. And I know I was always doing like sneaker stuff or working on my Instagram. I was always doing what, like something on my phone. Like, cause I, I being a receptionist, it's, it's a fairly easy job. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's nothing crazy. You answer phones, you direct people. So I had a lot of free time and I was like, well, I might as well do something else that'll make me money. If I'm just going to be sitting here. Yeah. And plus not only that, but I think your deal got, will go a lot faster. If we just oh yeah, doing something. you get really boring just <laughs> sitting there. And I was like, I was like, I never want to work a job like this again. No. So I think it, it pushed me also because I was like, I never want this kind of position like for the rest of my life. I just couldn't mm-hmm. see myself personally doing it. Yeah. Now with all these things going on, how do you allocate your time? So after your, your job, do you just, you know, eat then go straight to work on your other projects? Um, I, I don't start my job until mid-November. That's my start date. Oh, okay. 
So, um, so I've been kind of a little more free since um, I finished my last job back right before COVID ended. So um, right now I just spend most of my days just working on my own brands. Um, mm -hmm. um, most of my days doing that. Um, I, yeah. And then I'm sure once work starts, I'll be, you know, working during the day. Um, I know that I'm going to be going into work for about a month or two in office and then I'm switching to remote. Okay. So that'll be nice. Once I'm remote, I feel like it'll be a lot easier to like manage everything because I won't have to worry about um, traveling time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a, I'm not going to say a hard transition, but a transition that you do have to make um, because depending on how many hours you're going to put in, you know, you're going to have to offset some to focus on your work instead of your other brands and whatnot. So. Yeah, of course. But that's something that I'm totally fine with. And I feel like I always find time to kind of, even when I was in school, like I had to go to school full time and then I was still able to do this. So I think it'll be even easier because I won't have homework or tests to study for. So I, I don't think I would mind it. Um, I always like being busy. I don't really like to sit and do nothing. Um, mm -hmm. It bothers me. I get bored extremely quick. So I, mean, I definitely don't mind having a lot on my plate. I think I do better sometimes if I have a lot to do. Yeah. I remember in, in school, I had these awkward gaps. Say I had a class at two and then another one at four. So there's like an awkward, you know, two hour, sometimes three hour mm -hmm. gap. And I'd prefer to have back-to-back -back classes right away. Oh, me too. Just to feel really productive and then do whatever I want the rest of the day. Me too. I always took 8 a.m.s all throughout college. Um, I commuted to school, so I didn't have like the on-campus on thing. But I wanted all my classes done by like 2 o'clock. I wanted, like some people like don't have their first class until 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, no, I'd rather get there at 7.30 yeah. and be done by midday and have the rest of the day to myself. And because I would work. So after school, I would go to work and, mm -hmm. you know, and then I would get home around like six, seven o'clock. Yeah. I mean, everyone has their own little schedule, but yeah, for me, I just prefer to work right away and then chill later rather mm -hmm. than chill now and, you know, work later. Exactly. Because then I feel like in the morning, I'll just be thinking about what I have to do later and I'd rather just get it over with now and mm -hmm. then have the rest of the day. Yeah. Now, do you have priorities? Like what, do you mainly allocate your time to like now that you're starting your agency, do you have to put a lot more time into that compared to your personal brand? Um, in the beginning, yes. When I was doing more of just like the campaign management of it all and just building the brand itself and like, you know, creating the website, um, creating the socials for it, doing emails, all stuff like that, that took a lot more time. And I was definitely not focusing on like my Instagram and TikTok at all. Mm -hmm. But now that it's more self-sufficient and I don't really have to worry as much about it, um, I allocate more time to my personal stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking from personal experience, uh, of course, I try to utilize every single social media platform out there, you know, say LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, uh, mm -hmm. YouTube, you name it, right? And I try to produce in the beginning as much content on each platform as possible. But then I started to realize that I got very, very overwhelmed because a, sometimes when I post something on Twitter, I get literally no traction and maybe I'm not being patient, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel that I can allocate more of my time to TikTok because the organic reach is crazy. So if yeah. anyone's out there trying to grow, you know, their, their brand, do you think it's better to maybe apply the 80-20 principle where they focus, mo they focus most of their time on TikTok, 80% on TikTok, and then 20% can be, you know other social media platforms because you don't you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because say tiktok dies then you still have at least other platforms having some content there oh yeah i definitely think working with the most new platform is the best way to go so if you're let's say you don't have instagram you don't have any of these platforms and you're just mm -hmm. looking to start and you want to grow to have your own business then definitely start with tiktok because that's the newest it's the biggest right now um you know there's not even though there are a lot of influencers there's not as many on as instagram or youtube that are going to kind of overwhelm the market so you still have time to you know kind of get your own brand out there so i definitely think starting putting most of your time into tiktok 
and then worrying about the other platforms right okay. now, at least mm -hmm. until the next platform comes out. <laughs> and should one be religious about the new trends on TikTok or should you just be yeah. yourself and just post whatever mm. that makes you feel happy? I mean, it's nice to think that you can just <laughs> post whatever you want. Um, but if you're looking to really grow, yeah, I'll okay. look at the trend, see what's doing well and, you know, work with that. If you really don't like that trend, don't participate in it. If you mm -hmm. like it, you can. Was that something that you always implemented even back into, even back for Instagram? Whenever there was a new trend, you just hopped on it and ride that wave? I probably did subliminally because okay. it was like, I don't know, like Kylie Jenner was probably doing it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I could do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, subliminally, I'm sure I fell into trends. I feel like now it's a lot more prominent though, and trends are more specific. Mm -hmm. um, so now I think everybody notices them a lot more. Okay. How do you feel about Instagram reels now? Are you aggressive on that? No. No? I don't, I don't watch That's them. a trend though. <laughs> I know, but I don't like it. You see, like, if you don't like a trend, you don't do it. If you do like it, mm -hmm. use it. But I didn't like Instagram stories at first because I was like a Snapchat yeah. advocate and I loved it. And I still, it's, I still use Snapchat every single day. It's my favorite way to communicate. And I think that it's, people find it so weird because I'm 22 and they're like, okay, nobody over the age of like 15 uses Snapchat anymore, but I love it. <laughs> I still think it's a great way to communicate with my friends. But I remember when Instagram brought Instagram stories, I was like, oh, I don't like this. I'm not going to use it because they're just copying Snapchat. And now I use it. So I might be the same with reels where right now I don't mm -hmm. like it because I, I like TikTok too much, but we'll see in like a year or so how I feel it might change right now. I, I don't watch reels though. I really don't. Mm -hmm. them. Yeah. I feel like most people post their TikToks onto reels. No, exactly. I was going to say so that. I, I saw it already. No. Yeah. Um, I personally, I don't think you should create your own custom reels and then your own custom TikTok separately. That's going to be a lot of work. And yeah, mm -hmm. everyone, to be honest, I was super skeptical about Instagram reels because when I first tested it out, I had no views whatsoever, but now people are huge advocates for Instagram reels. They're getting a lot of attention, a lot of organic reach through reels. And I think it's like, why not? Maybe why not repost some of your older TikToks onto reels so you yeah. can grow your Instagram and whatnot. Oh yeah. No, I'm all for that. I think, um, no, there's definitely, you don't need to be creating totally different content for different platforms. You can, I see most people just um, copy their TikToks and post it onto Reels. The yeah. only thing with me is that I feel like I always see them on TikTok first. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of and course. Then, yeah. So I'm mm -hmm. still, I'm still iffy about it. I have to, I have to give it a chance. I'm mm -hmm. not giving it a chance. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. And just going back to what you said of when you posted cooking content on TikTok, one mm -hmm. of my biggest flaws, I think, was, you know, on my TikTok, it looked way, way too uh, familiar. It looked kind of like a carbon copy to what my Instagram looks like. And okay. if you go from, say, TikTok to Instagram, there's no real difference. And I think that's a problem. Do you think mm -hmm. it's very important that, you know, for each platform that you have, make sure you add a different element to it? Yeah. I okay. think so. Um, don't make them identical because mm -hmm. then they could just use one platform and get all yeah. your information and they won't follow you on both. Um, yeah. See what works. Definitely try out different things. Like my cooking actually doesn't do very well on TikTok. It's something that I enjoy and I post just because I enjoy it. But mm -hmm. then I do like story times and I do like the trends and that does well on TikTok. So, you know, find what works and then you can also implement what you like. Yeah. How do you, make a list or how do you kind of think about your ideas for content creation? Do you literally just think of, think of an idea off the top of your head or do you make a list of things that you're going to make throughout the week? No, I think about it off the top, unless uh, it's, unless it's a brand deal, okay. then um, it's more thought out and you know, it'll take me like a week or two to do everything. But if it's just, for TikTok, I'll, I'll pretty much think of it on the spot. Uh, I don't really put a lot of thought into it. Mm -hmm. Instagram is a little more thought out. If I have a trip coming up, then I, I plan a little bit in advance, but um, it depends the platform, how much I allocate time to planning. Mm -hmm. And do you try to post, I know you said post two, three times a day on TikTok, mm -hmm. um, but say you're super busy. Do you try to have extra posts in your drafts that way? Yeah. Okay. 
definitely. I have I have so many things in my draft. A lot of them are just like goofy things, but mm-hmm. I do like to keep a few things in my drafts in case I'm really busy one week or um, I don't have time. You could just pick something from there. Yeah, I have a, a few things in my draft and uh, more specifically for Instagram. I just mm-hmm. found out about this a couple of weeks ago, but the creator studio on Facebook and Instagram where you can literally, I thought that the only way to schedule your content was using um, later.com or really? what's that? Or what's that hoop suite? Like a third party? Yeah, a third party where you can schedule our content. I thought I needed that. You know, they, oh, do, no. they do have a freemium model, but I discovered uh, the creator studio on Facebook oh, and I can wow. literally schedule everything because before I was like so annoyed posting things one by one by one. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, this is really darn annoying and so for all my instagram for all my instagram content at least i dedicate one day or two days on a weekend to post all my content for the whole week and that's nice it just that way you don't have to worry about it yeah Yeah. whereas for instagram i mean you can't really schedule it you can just make your drafts for as far as i know just make your drafts and just post it um some people say yeah i don't know if you can schedule it not that i know of Mm mm-hmm I don't think so. There might be a third party out there, but it's not, nothing through TikTok yet. Yeah. Yeah. And the TikTok algorithm is weird. Some people say there's certain times to post, but people say mm-hmm. you can post back to back to back because the algorithm is going to take care of everything. And, you know, yeah. you have real, really no control if your content is going to blow up or not. You don't. And I don't, so apparently the TikTok algorithm is it gives it to a handful of people if they like it and they watch it, it goes to a bigger group and then a bigger group and bigger group. Mm-hmm. I think that's how it works. And then if you get a lot of shares in the beginning, it does well. I don't know. I, I, re- I read articles about it of like how to like do well on TikTok or like what the algorithm even is. And I don't think anyone knows. I've, I'm convinced that I don't think anyone knows. There's probably... Because, because I think they change it a lot. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if people have, I mean, I'm pretty sure people have insights that can definitely help but oh, to know yeah, everything. Oh yeah, using certain like hashtags. Oh yeah. But um, I definitely think they do switch up their algorithm like pretty often. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if you, the, the hashtag for the, the for you page hashtag. I don't, I don't even, even know if that's anymore. Yeah. I don't think that's even relevant anymore. I know. In I still beginning. do it sometimes <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, why am I, or the X, Y, Z, C, oh, yeah. A, like, <laughs> like, a, like a mini hack like a cheat code <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a video game or something uh-huh. like that they were like if you do that hashtag like, it'll blow up and then it, it does it didn't mm-hmm. wait what was your initial reaction when you went viral you said you had tw- uh, 10 million views on uh on one video so i posted that video kind of as a joke just for really my friends because they didn't have a lot of followers on tiktok and mm-hmm. i was really using it for fun and I posted it and I went to sleep because I posted it, I think like around 10 o'clock and I, I went to bed right after. And then I woke up to a billion texts <laughs> and my boyfriend was like, wake up. He was like, it has so many views. <laughs> and he was like freaking out. And I, I woke up and I looked and it had like, I think like 5 million views or some, something like that overnight. And just like thousands and thousands of comments. And I was like, what? The Did you respond what? to all of them? I tried reading a lot of them though because I I never had anything like that happen where it was millions Mm -hmm. and I was like what like and everybody wanted like a part two to the video Uh, so I didn't want to be like one of those people that wait like five ten days to post a part two so mm -hmm. pretty much like an hour later I filmed it and I posted it because I think that I think they appreciated that I don't like when someone posts something and then you know, there's going to be a part two and they're like, oh, stay tuned. And it's like a week later and there's nothing there. I'm like, well, now I want to unfollow you. Yeah. The sooner the better. And that kind of yeah. just reminds me if like, say you have a, a partner or a, a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, you know, there comes a question like, should you respond five minutes later after read the text or should you, should you <sighs> respond right away? That's a, yeah. a, that's up for debate. I don't know, but. Oh yeah. That's up for debate <laughs> for sure. I don't like it when people purposely wait. I think it's annoying. Yeah, I but think if you're I know already, people, yeah, people have their own opinions. They're like, you know, you gotta like, it's like a chasing game, but nah, there's times where someone will text me and I'm on my phone and that can literally text like 10 milliseconds after they text me, mm-hmm. but they're probably thinking I'm very weird. So I'm like, okay, I'm right? going to wait, I'm going to wait, like, I'm going to wait a minute or two. Phones. I'm going to wait a minute or two to not seem too weird. 
and then yeah are they but, they're gonna yeah. think i'm a bot or something for responding like 10 seconds like right after they sent something yeah but i wanted to post the part two um pretty soon after just because there mm -hmm. were a lot of questions about the tiktok so yeah and then you can always ride that right that wave you know part three part four um yeah if you really um, want i to. don't yeah i did i took um since the TikTok was about a like Disney celebrity that was not so nice to me, I kind of took that and rolled with it. And since I, you know, I've been able to go to a lot of cool events, um, work with brands where I've met, you know, different influencers and celebrities. Um, I started a series where I rate my celebrity interactions um, and just kind of talk about my experience with them, how they were, which I think did well. It did well. It did get... I mean, there's good and bad and everything, you know, people are being like, well, if you met them one time, like you can't tell if you really know mm, them, true, but true. I was just purely giving first impressions, how I thought they were. And pretty much, I mean, most of the people that I met were very nice. There was only like, it was like very few that weren't nice. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, it's really hard. People say you can judge someone from the first encounter, mm -hmm. but maybe that person had an off day and, you know, it's just yeah, unfortunate like that you got the bad side, you know? Yeah, exactly. But no, it, it's just because it went along with the TikTok that did yeah. well. I knew I knew people like that content, so I was like, okay, well, let me let me continue. Let me keep doing something like that, and that did well. Mm -hmm. And going back to you know, you said you met a Disney celebrity, and you said you met them as a. Well, I didn't meet. What was it a? a the, the TikTok that did well was about a Disney celebrity. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He's not. I don't know. He was like on a show in like like years ago and we would talk and dm and we became pretty good friends and i go to la a lot for work um mm -hmm. and just my family loves la we go there a lot and we were talking about it and we we've been like facetiming and talking for months at this point and i was like okay like I, i'm probably gonna come to la soon and he was like oh if you come around super bowl like me and my friends are having like a big party we'll hang out i was like yeah sure that's fine so um, I planned my trip, booked it, me and my mom went. Um, and as soon as I landed, I was blocked on everything. Yeah. Um, I tried calling, I, I thought that it was a mistake. So I'm like, oh, maybe when I get to the hotel, it, it'll be fine. It was probably the, the air in the plane that did mm -hmm. that. No, it wasn't. Um, yeah. Wow, and you then, got ghosted? Yeah, totally. And people went a little crazy and went to his profile and I think his his photo that he posted I guess which was right around the time that I posted my TikTok went from like a few hundred comments to like 10,000 comments damn of people just being like <laughs> why did you do that and I was like because my mom was like go to his page like go look and I was like oh my <laughs> god people were like hashtagging like team Nicole I was like Oh, I got to, I got way too political. <laughs> <laughs> and this happened like uh, two, th two, three years ago. And I was like, well, at least I'm getting like <laughs> yeah. closure now, I guess. But he, I don't think he ever came out and said anything about it. I know that he made fun of it apparently on Twitter. Someone sent it to me, but mm -hmm. people even changed like his Wikipedia. Really? Yeah, it was, it was pretty insane. Yeah. I and mean, social, social media is uh, it's just crazy it's crazy it's a double-edged sword you gotta you gotta be on the right end of it you know yeah well that's why i guess such mm -hmm. a big topic now is cancel culture like how do you feel about cancel culture i mean i'm fine with it i think removing the likes is kind of a cool aspect because say i think in some countries they remove likes for instagram mm -hmm. and you know people just love having a lot of likes but if you kind of remove that it kind of gives you an incentive to post a lot more without having to worry about people not liking your photo or not. Yeah. But what do you feel about people being canceled? Like if they do something, let's see if they find something from your past that you did something that wasn't politically mm. correct or something like that. How do you feel about people in social media now? And I think it happened to Bryce, one of the TikTokers mm -hmm. who were like canceled. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you think that it's I, good? I mean, to be honest, everyone should know the whole story and you're not sure. going to know the whole story over one snippet. So it can be very unjust, if that's fair mm -hmm. to say, right? 
So yeah. I'm not really for that unless you have the full picture, right? Mm -hmm. Once everybody knows for sure the concrete picture of what actually happened. And if this was like five, 10 years ago, it is super tricky because it depends on the circumstance. You know, you might need yeah. a lawyer for this one. I don't know because you can be a completely different person one year, two years down yeah. the line. But I think it depends on the situation. Everyone has to know the story. You know, literally there can be one TMZ story that everyone believes in, but then mm -hmm. there could be another source telling something completely different. You know, it's really yeah. hard to get your true news, what you actually believe in. And I don't know, I feel everyone's divided, but to answer your question, I don't believe it's the right thing to do unless mm -hmm. we have the full picture. What yeah. No, I think me, I think, I think me too. I'm very divided on it also, just because if somebody just did that and they weren't an influencer or celebrity, nobody would think anything of it, but just because they're in the public eye, they deserve, like, do they deserve to be canceled over something they did so long mm -hmm. ago that maybe was a mistake or they, they weren't aware of it? Um, I don't know. Like, should they have their like whole career? Some people's entire careers get taken down over it. Oh yeah. And you know, I, I don't think it's fair because if they weren't in the public eye, that wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And you probably know a lot more about this than, than me because you know, you've been in the acting industry, you know, Hollywood, I heard, I hear it's very, very political. And you know, of course you can have all the talent in the world, but you have to depend on certain people to get you to that role or that job. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. if they know one thing that's bad about you or they don't like you for whatever reason, you're not going to get that one position. So it becomes very, very, very political. Um, oh, yeah. I think yeah. all of Hollywood is extremely political. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. I like to compare music, like the music mm -hmm. industry and the, the movie industry, where with music, there's so many platforms where you can just blow up and be found. For example, like Justin Bieber on YouTube and Usher found him, right? And it yeah. became super popular. Whereas if you're a movie star, you know, he has to go through the ropes and no matter how talented you are, you may not get that shot because you need to have those right connections. So it's oh, definitely yeah. it needs a lot. to be the right connection, the right place, the right time, the right audition. It, it, mm -hmm. It's not easy. There's a lot of variables from what I yeah. understand. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, Nicole, I don't want to take too much of a time here. So if people want to find you, hit you up, where can they, what social media platforms can they hit you up on? Um, my Instagram is just my, it's Nicole underscore Cardinelli. So it's just Cardinal with an E at the end. And then my TikTok is Nicole M Cardinelli. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. So yeah, I'll put that in the show link. So if anyone's interested, they can Thanks. DM you for any advice on, on how to be an influencer or how to post better content, maybe new sure. trends. Yeah. So yeah, Nicole, I really do appreciate your time here. Oh, of course. Really Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.